Welcome to the Zildjian Company. My name is Craigie Zildjian, and I'm the first female CEO of the family business. I'm Armin Zildjian's daughter, granddaughter to Avidus Zildjian. In so many respects, Avidus, my grandfather, was ahead of his time. For example, he continuously told me and my sister Debbie that there was no reason women couldn't be just as successful in business as men. I'm Debbie Zildjian and I'm Vice President of Human Resources. I've been officially involved with the company, I would say, now for about 25 years, but of course, as the daughter of Armin and the granddaughter of Avidus Zildjian, I've been involved in the family business my whole life. This business is the symbol-making business, the Avidus Zildjian Symbol Company. C-Y-M-B-A-L used in religious ceremonies and in Janissary bands in Turkey. My family is Armenian, but lived on the European side of Constantinople in a town named Samatya. It dates back to 1623, when Avidus I discovered the secret formula for making an incredibly clear and brilliant sounding symbol. His symbols did sound different from anything that had ever been created before. The Sultan took note, asked Avidus to join the court and to make special symbols for him. So he lived in the palace. And in 1623, the Sultan allowed Avidus to go out on his own. And so that's what we call the birth of the Zildjian Company, 1623. Zildjian, Z-I-L is Turkish or Armenian for symbol. D-J is maker, and I-A-N is an Armenian suffix for son of a, so son of a symbol maker, symbolsmith. Dating back to 1623, the Zildjian Company is the oldest family business in America. In 1972, this factory was completed. We only manufacture here in Norwell, Massachusetts. We moved into this building really to celebrate our 350th anniversary. In 1929, the business was located in Quincy, north of here. The original factory on 39 Fayette Street was very close to the train station, and that was convenient in the early days when the company was starting up. Drummers would come to Boston, take the train down to the factory. That's when the business really started to take shape. He became very, very close with Gene Cooper. Gene asked my grandfather, can you make a thinner cymbal for the drum kit instead of these heavy marching cymbals? Because cymbals had always been heavy marching cymbals. And he did, and you know, it just became really popular. Joe Jones came along, really popularized the hi-hat. And all these terms never existed before, so you had to just make a name up. Well, this, this sounds like crash cymbal, so we're gonna call this a crash. And this is sort of a ride beat. That's a ride cymbal. All of that terminology originated here with my grandfather and the drumming community. So this was the emergence, really, of the drum kit as we know it. And my grandfather was an important part of that. Artists love to come here, visit us, and we love to have them. One of the most fun parts about being in this business is when a drummer comes here for the first time to see how excited he or she gets. When the office was first built back in 1972, my father, who was very artistic as well as being musical, wanted the lobby to have that Middle Eastern feel, to have it recall the history of our company and our family. And that's why we have a lot of oriental rugs, the shape and design of the columns there. And of course now we've added the, the drum kits. We started asking some of our dearest and closest endorsers if they'd be willing to donate a kit because they're just such a part of our history. So this really began with Elvin Jones's kit. And that's a very special kit because Elvin was just such a very warm, enthusiastic, happy person. And he made a number of visits here and got the biggest kick out of seeing his drum set there. And then right next to Elvin's kit, we have a replica of Ringo Starr's kit, which brings you right back to the era of the Beatles. I mean, you look at the kit and you really feel like it's 1964 all over again. And then across from them, we have more of the modern artist's kit in Travis Barker. Travis's kit features the platinum symbols, which we manufactured in the 1980s. And then right next to Travis's kit, we have Dennis Chambers, and that's just a fabulous kit. It's this bright, bright yellow, and knowing Dennis, that's his color, and it just, you know, big excitement, big, 
big kit that he used on the Santana tour. We have Buddy Rich's set here. Buddy gave that to my father as a gift. My father had to have been his biggest fan. And there's the quote there that when Buddy was dying of a brain tumor, my father said, I've got your drum set, Buddy. And Buddy turned to my father and said, Zilge, take care of it, won't you? And the next day he was gone. But we have a part of Buddy Rich here. As we do with Max Roach, he wrote a score on Pies of Quincy. Pies, a, a nickname for symbols. Quincy is, is where we used to be before we moved to Norwell. When people come here to visit, I want them to be able to learn about the history of symbols and symbol making. The process has evolved in, in a lot of ways, but in some ways it's still the very same process that it was back in 1623. For instance, the mixing of the metals is exactly the same. It's 80% copper, 20% tin, a little bit of silver here and there, but actually that's how the whole process starts, the mixing of the metals. And the secret is in how we mix those metals and what we do in that room where you see the door that says absolutely no admittance. There are only a few people that are allowed to be in that room to understand and execute the special process. My father had been planning this for a long time, which is really funny because he usually doesn't keep secrets. And just one day he asked Debbie and, and me to accompany him to the melt room. He opened the door and he brought us in and he explained exactly what was happening in there. This was very powerful. It really tied us into the whole family history. We became the first women who had an understanding of the secret alloy. Yeah, it was, it was exciting, but at the same time, it was a bit of a burden, you think. Now I know, I have to keep this secret. So when the metal is poured into molds, and we pour it different weights, we'll have a range of castings that can be very small, two pound castings all the way up to 22, 24, pound castings. And obviously the smaller castings are used for the splash symbols, you know, an 8 inch, 6 inch, 10 inch splash, all the way up to 24 inch ride symbols for the larger castings. We still heat the castings the same way, we still roll them through the rolling mills the same way, but we've taken a lot of the physical labor out of it. We now have what we call an automated material handler. It goes into the oven, places the castings in, and now the castings rotate around the furnace. And that's been an improvement because now every casting that goes through the rotary is heated at the same temperature consistently. In the old box ovens, the castings in the back heated for a longer time period at a higher temperature. When you open the oven, the castings in the front part would cool off. And that would lead to a lot of breaking and inconsistency when they were rolled. The melt room, the rolling, the metal is always worked when it's hot. And it's very brittle at that point, so you have to be very careful with it. By turning the blank 90 degrees with every pass through the rollers, we develop a cross-grain structure, and that enhances the sound and durability of the finished symbol.